morning service has unfolded because I am preaching on a lofty topic today, uh, the topic of heaven, literally lofty. Um, I, you don't know how I labor to try to get you out of here on time. I know some of you say, preach, 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 and some of you are like, conclude, conclude. Uh, so uh, here we are. And I have worked hard. If you looked at my outline, you would see X's through large chunks of uh, the outline, trying to be kind to those of you that like uh, brevity. I want to read to you a verse. Um, and I want, as we read it, I want you to think of what does this verse do to your spirit? How does it make you feel uh, as I read this verse? James 4.14 says this, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, a little time, and then vanisheth uh, away. What would you say today if I said my goal is to encourage you uh, to bring a smile to your face and a, a pep to your step? Uh, what would you say, having just asked you to consider what does this verse do to your spirit? Uh, your life is as a vapor, vanishing away. Well, some would say I'm not feeling it. <laughs> it's not very encouraging. You'd be in good company. Uh, King Hezekiah found that he was going to be uh, leaving this earth soon. And at the uh, hearing of that, he pleaded with God and cried out and prayed to God God, could I just stay a little longer? And God extended his life 15 years. Uh, he added to his life, and if you know the story, it was not a good 15 years. Uh, God had a perfect plan in mind. Uh, and so Hezekiah, though, would be with you if you're like, that verse did not encourage me. My life is a vapor. Uh, you'd be in good company. But imagine that godly Paul who says uh, that he's looking forward for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He goes on in that same passage in, first, in Philippians 1.23. He goes on to say, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. How does Paul have such clarity that heaven is far better? Thinking of that verse, how did you feel when you read that verse? I've got a family vacation coming up. Uh, it's going to be a time with family. It's going to be a time where the, the normal responsibilities have been removed. I am looking forward to it. If I could speed it up, uh, if I had a, a, a dial, uh, I would skip the next period of time and just to get to it. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And, and there's a, a wait. Uh, to this life. There's a weight to our responsibilities. I don't, it's going to be a couple years, but retirement, as that time gets closer and closer, I'm not sad uh, about that. I'm looking forward to these things. If when you read the verse, life is but a vapor, our time here is short, if you were even a little discouraged, today I'm hoping that uh, some things about heaven will be clearer. Uh, and yes, there is a sadness to uh, those that we would leave behind. But as Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It's going to be a good day uh, when we get to see our Savior, when, we, when these cares of life are passed to a different generation and we go home. I helped a man up out of his seat yesterday. I helped him up. And he said, thanks, I'm getting new legs, and I've heard of new hips, and I've heard of new knees. But I, and I said, you mean in heaven? And he said, yes, in heaven. Uh, we're gonna, it's going to be a good day. And if, we, if we're sad about the brevity of life, I do understand. But I'm hoping to encourage you today. Heaven is far better. Let's pray about the message. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for the promises that you've given us in your holy word. I believe they're there, Lord, to carry us uh, when we think that we can't go on or when we think 
that it's just too heavy uh, what's before us, Lord. There's a promise of heaven, Lord. Let it lift us today. Let us encourage us. Let it encourage us uh, in our thoughts, in our deeds, in the way we view things. Lord, help us to see and hear from you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I've uh, made up a fictitious book to help illustrate a point. Uh, This is not a real book, but what if I were to say there was a book named uh, The Joy of Motherhood, and in its description, uh, it would be described as the thrill of carrying a baby, the contractions, the delivery, and nursing uh, of the baby. And I were to say that it's written from the personal experience and the memoirs of Jonathan Manley. (laughs) You guys are listening. That's great. I didn't know if anyone would get it. Uh, Jonathan Manley can't experience the thrills of contractions. And he's no more qualified to do that. But here's an interesting thing. When we think of heaven... Uh, that most holy of places, that spiritual dwelling place for you and I for eternity and God's dwelling place, Jonathan Manley is more qualified to write of the joys of contractions than you and I would be to write of heaven. It's so far removed from our understanding uh, in our carnality at best. uh, we're, We're still carnal. We can't conceive of it. There's a passage in Ezekiel uh, where we read of uh, Ezekiel has a vision. God shows him a glimpse of heaven and there's fires enfolding on itself and he sees uh, four creatures and each of the creatures has four heads and they have wings that are connected and under the wings there's hands and there's wings and they're moving without moving and there's wheels within wheels and the wheels have eyes and, and the, the, it's a, to try to conceive of it, you can't. And as you read it, I read it several times this week, it's beyond our comprehension. Uh, and, and I think on purpose, God has made heaven uh, beyond us. It, it's, it's so far uh, more than we could possibly reason. Uh, and, I, and I bring up Ezekiel to illustrate that point. We cannot take in heaven, and yet Jesus wants us thinking about heaven. In the four Gospels, he mentions heaven. Uh, there's 86 mentions of heaven almost exclusively by Jesus. In the Bible, 582 times they mention heaven. I think God wants us thinking about heaven. Uh, in Hebrews Chapter 12, uh, verse 2, it says, the author there is saying, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is written about Jesus right before the cross was had heaven on his mind. Do you When's the last time you thought that God has prepared a place called heaven and that's where we're, we're heading? Uh, Jesus was thinking about heaven. Uh, Paul, we had mentioned, was looking forward to, not just neutral, but looking forward to heaven. How could Paul say, it's better for me uh, to, to go to heaven than to continue serving here? How could he say that? Paul, we read of in in 2 Corinthians, I believe it was, was stoned, we believe, to death. And he was carried up to what was called the third heaven. And if you ever hear of the third heaven, that's not three layers of heaven where the the great and noble are and then the ones that just made it in, they're in the lower heaven. The the first heaven uh, is our atmosphere. Uh, The second heaven is where our stars live. And that third heaven... Uh, is the dwelling place of God. So Paul was caught up into the third heaven and he saw a glimpse of heaven. He says, I don't know if it was in the body or out of the body, uh, but he saw heaven and he, he said uh, in Philippians 3, chapter 20, 
He said, for our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven from whence uh, also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul was beaten, as Paul was whipped, as Paul was imprisoned, as Paul was in the ocean, uh, as Paul was ridiculed and despised, what carried Paul, I believe, was that glimpse, and God gave it to him on purpose. At the beginning of your ministry, I'm going to show you something that's going to carry you. The idea of heaven. Do you need to be carried a little bit today? And have you thought of heaven? I believe it will do the trick uh, as it did for Paul, as it did for Jesus. Uh, Abraham, in Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, it says, By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, uh, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac, with Jacob, the heirs of him, the same promise. Uh, as Abraham was journeying in the promised land, uh, as he was having trouble finding water, as, as he, he was there, he did not put down roots in that promised land, but he journeyed as a stranger. And it goes on to say in Hebrews 11, verse 10, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for that. And are, you put, are your roots here? Is everything that is important, all important to you, here on this side of heaven, and missed sight, missed the view of that which is eternal? We get it backwards, don't we? Heaven and our spiritual walk with God is counterintuitive. We talked about this with the youth group as we built a giant fire uh, outside. This life... It goes against uh, where, why would the first be last? I don't think the, you'll see that in, in the professional training uh, executives might get. Uh, why would we uh, give that we might receive? Uh, all of these things. And, and God says, I want you to think about the eternal while you live here in the temple. And we get it backwards, not understanding heaven. There are some simple thoughts uh, of heaven that I want to uh, go over before we address, a, a, I think, the coolest thought, but it is not exactly simple. Uh, and the very easy one, uh, Sunday school uh, student Billy, first day visiting, he's in Sunday school, and the teacher says, class, raise your hand if you'd like to go to heaven. And all of the children put up their hand, and there's new Billy, and his hand is not up. And the teacher says, Billy, uh, you don't want to go to heaven. And Billy said, oh, I, I thought you were putting a team together for right now. He said, <laughs> <laughs> but we need to die before we can get to heaven. Uh, it's a simple thing. Paul says in Corinthians, to be absent from the body uh, is to be present with the Lord. Uh, so we need to die before we get to heaven. Uh, which way is heaven? I was uh, giving the gospel out in the park, and I, I sometimes would stay longer than I would want to, compelled. Uh, it's the gospel, and it's heaven and hell. Uh, so I, I would have trouble leaving and, and making a, an appointment that I had made. And so I saw a man walking towards me, and I was walking this way, and I needed to go, uh, but I wanted to address a quick thought. And I said, friend, do you know uh, when you die, which way are you going, up or down? Uh, and he, he said, up, praise the Lord, because I wanted to go home. <laughs> but up, he pointed up, and is it up? For our Chinese friends on the other side, when they point, are they going a different direction? Uh, which way is heaven? Is it up? Uh, there's some very interesting thoughts, uh, simple thoughts, not at all deep. Uh, in Leviticus, God says to the, uh, the priests, he says in Leviticus 1, verse uh, 11, speaking of the priest, and he shall kill it, the, the sacrifice, and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward, before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall sprinkle his blood round about the altar. For some reason, 
they, he wanted the priest to alter to sacrifice on the north side of the altar. I thought that was interesting. In Psalm 75, verse 6, uh, when you hear the word promotion, they're speaking of salvation. For promotion cometh not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. I'm not even going to tell you which way it comes from. It came from three directions. No, yes, from the other one. In case you were sleeping, it was north. Uh, in Job chapter 26 and verse 7, it says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Think about that for a minute. Job is the most, uh, many believe, is the, the earliest book uh, the first written scripture that we have. And he says two truths in that one verse that are beyond uh, his ability. The Holy Spirit gave him this uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, He stretcheth out over the north an empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. For a primitive man, uh, I don't know if many of them journeyed further than 10 miles, or possibly if you were an explorer, 100 miles. How could you understand that we're living on a ball of dirt hanging from nothing? Even those intelligent Egyptians believed we were living on a disk supported by four columns. But Job, at the inspiration of God, says we're living uh, on a ball that's hanging from nothing. And he, in that same passage, he says, speaking of God, he stretches out the north over the empty place. Well, did you know in the north of our universe, the scientists have found with some massive telescope on a mountaintop in California, an empty place. In the north of our universe, and it's big enough to hold 2,000 Milky Way galaxies. It's huge. There's some thought that heaven is in the north of our universe. It almost would make sense. I know our gravitational pull is from other things, but we're drawn north. In Isaiah 14, verse 13, we read this, For thou hast said in thy heart, speaking of Lucifer, when he, when he rebels and when he falls, he says in Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Uh, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Psalm 48, verse 1 and 2 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole world is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. I'm wondering, is heaven northward? Uh, if we were uh, E.T., you know, E.T. phone home, <laughs> we'd have to find out which way is north and then, and then point. Heaven uh, is a place uh, of righteousness. In Second Peter 3.13 we read, Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's a sobering point about heaven. Heaven is righteous, only righteous. How could you and I possibly get in unless God does a work and makes us righteous? Very obvious, heaven is the dwelling place of God in Second Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 30. Solomon in his prayer of dedication says, Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. It says, For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. And here's the shocker of shockers. Uh, I don't know, have you ever been picked for something that you thought, I am not qualified for this? I've been picked about two and a half years ago for something that I didn't think I was qualified for. 
Uh, and I've been here for about two and a half years, coincidentally. <laughs> God, his desire is to have you in heaven. Can you imagine? God knowing you, God seeing you, longs to have you to be with him in heaven. In Matthew chapter 22 and verses 1 and 3, we read, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. In this parable, he's speaking of Israel, rejecting the gospel, rejecting the Messiah, uh, and actually killing the prophets of God. And as uh, they do this, God temporarily sets Israel aside, and we go on to read of God's uh, calling of the Gentile nation to heaven, uh, to be one with him. In Matthew 22, verses 8 through 10, we read, Then said he unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all, as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. God wants you and I to be with him in heaven. What a miracle. As uh, scholarly as you might be, as much of a theologian uh, as you might be, as, as brilliant as you are, we cannot comprehend heaven. Our uh, inability to conceive of the realities of heaven, I believe, causes us to live life as though heaven were some abstract theory. And we, we lose that uh, inspiration and we lose that view of what God has set before us. Are you thinking of heaven as you live life? And when you think about it, are you thinking clearly about what it is? I don't know how many of you have had glimpses of heaven. Uh, I wish I could say I've had 10. 10 is not that many for, for 58 years. Oh, I don't do the math. Is that 5.8 years of vision? Uh, a handful. Of, uh, I can remember at a conference, and the, there was probably, I don't know, it wasn't 1,000, but it was a load of people, and they were singing for all they were worth. Uh, and the music, and were gifted uh, musicians and singers, and uh, it, it, it carried me to a place uh, and gave me a glimpse of heaven. I don't know if in prayer ever you're allowed to lose yourself and come before God in prayer uh, and, and have... Your carnality, and honestly, I think uh, I visualize the, the, that, that ball and that paddle, uh, and, and you, I was never very good at it, but I, I think as we're drawn towards heaven and we get that glimpse, uh, uh, like that ball is sucked back so quickly from the glimpse in that uh, rubber band being our carnality, and, and we see a glimpse of God, we lose ourselves for a moment uh, and we're sucked back uh, to tread in the muck and the mire, pushing our little cart of life. But if we can hold to the vision and hold to the glimpse and hold to the understanding that God wants you there, I believe it, it will change your life. If we think of heaven as it is and the realities of it, and honestly to see the realities of it, we need to understand a little bit that it is a particular place. Just as you've come here uh, and you see uh, not quite heaven as you see a rip in the pew uh, or the, the shade that won't stay up, but heaven is a place designed by God. In John 14, verses 1 to 3, 
Jesus is right about to leave here and go to heaven. And he says this to his disciples. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start at one. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We read of this so many times, and we see in my Father's house that our mind so quickly jumps to heaven. But if I were to go back in time, and if I were to go back to ancient Israel, and I were to approach uh, the city walls of Jerusalem, and I were to ask an Israelite, can you point me to the house of God? In my Father's house are many mansions, speaking of heaven, and yet if we were to go to Israel, they would not point up, but they would point over and say the house of God is there, and, and there we would find the temple of God. And my desire today is to bring to our understanding truly what is heaven. And I believe reasonably some of you out of your love for your puppy will come and say, do you think my puppy will be in heaven? And, and I don't know, I, I heard a funny uh, message that somebody was asked, is my, is my puppy going to be in heaven? And the preacher said, absolutely. If that puppy were to understand that Jesus died on the cross and pray that prayer, God forgive me, uh, kind of joking, but we have thoughts of, of silliness, really of what does heaven look like. As a young man, I loved hunting and shooting enough where I wondered if there'd be some sort of range in heaven where I could go shoot or possibly hunt. You know, the idea of killing one of God's creation in heaven. It's a horrible thought. Horrible. Uh, but in our carnality, so the connection that I want to bring today and help us to, to grapple with is that heaven is the temple of God, there's a really strange connection that I want to bring out and that you'll need to stay focused to, to grip. The first temple, a temple being the dwelling place of God on earth where God reveals himself to man and man serves and glorifies God. So let me say it again, the dwelling place of God on earth where God reveals himself to man and man serves and glorifies God. That's heaven. The first heaven being Eden, the dwelling place of God, right? Man and God could dwell together. There was an intermediate place, that go-between. The Holy of Holies was one. The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, in their journeys in the wilderness, the Holy of Holies in that place, uh, that temple built in Israel. And did you know that the Holy of Holies was a cube? It was uh, about, this stage is about 15 feet deep uh, and about 15 feet wide this way and about 15 high. That would be the size of the Holy of Holies. It was a, a cubed dimension. That was a temple of God. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, we read this. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Did you know that Jesus was a temple was a, for the Holy Ghost to live in? God's dwelling place with mankind. That temporary a uh, place where Jesus came to earth, God dwelt in Christ, and he was a go-between uh, for man and God. And here's the strangest of all, uh, not quite yet our deep point, but this is truly strange. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, it says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, ye are not your own. Have you thought of that? God, your, your body 
is a temporary dwelling for God uh, to rest, reside, and manifest to others uh, His presence. And that as He dwells there, we're to glorify Him uh, in this temple called our body. Here's the part where I need you to focus. If you've been asleep, wake up. Uh, if your neighbor's sleeping, wake him up or her. Uh, this, is, this is the interesting part. There's a change that takes place in heaven. And there's a change that takes place uh, in our bodies. That is, uh, it's really not deep, but I haven't thought about it in this week, in this way. Uh, did you just wake up Nita, Brian? I, I, wake him up. Uh, or her up, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 54 says a familiar passage, but we're going to link it to Revelation. And I think if you follow it, it will be a wow moment. In 1 Corinthians 15, 53, we, we see this. For this, corruption, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. There's a lot of corruptible and incorruptibles in there, but in, in other words, when we set aside the temporary and we put on the permanent of God, death is going to be no more. Death is swallowed up. That has not yet happened. And even as we're going to cross into Revelation uh, and the early parts of heaven, death has not been swallowed up. As we, as we look in Revelation, temple is mentioned 12 or 13 times in Revelation. I want to give you an example of the mention of, of temple in Revelation eleven nineteen. It says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony, or the ark of the covenant. Uh, there were lightnings and voices and thunderings uh, and an earthquake and great hail. In heaven there is a temple. It should not be too hard for us to uh, visualize a progression that takes place in heaven because God says to John, in the beginning of the of Revelation, he said, I want you to write down uh, things that were, uh, things that I'm going to show you that are now, and I want you to write down things that we will see together. I'm going to show you some things. Some of the things in Revelation have not yet happened. But here, in the middle of Revelation, we're seeing a temple of God. And we see it well through the book of of. Uh, Revelation, that one book particularly dedicated to show us heaven. It gets very interesting. We're going to see that passage where death is swallowed up. That passage that's mentioned in Corinthians. In Revelation 20, 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, uh, which, the, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Continuing on in verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Did you see that in 14? It says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death now has been swallowed up. In that passage where Corinthians says, when this uh, mortal shall put on immortality, when this corruptible shall be made incorruptible, death is going to be swallowed up. And here in Revelation, we see that death has been swallowed up. So it's at this time I believe that we, possibly even the marriage supper of our Lamb, of the Lamb, something changes in uh, who we are at this time in heaven. And you'll see it clearly as we continue to read in Revelation 21, the second to the last book uh, in the Bible. Something changes when God uh, takes death 
and he takes the, the dragon and he sends them to hell, something changes. In Revelation 21, verse 1 to 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a, a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Listen to this that we read of in Revelation chapter 21. A lot has passed, and there's been a time in heaven uh, for many of the saints gathered in heaven, uh, seeing the throne, and it's in Revelation 21 when we read in verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Wow! I would have thought the moment I arrive in heaven, my tears were dried up. I would have thought the moment uh, I arrive in heaven uh, that the sorrow and the pain, and I do believe uh, that if I have an achy knee, uh, I, that is gone. My body has been left behind. But when my soul and my spirit come into the presence of God in heaven, I would think that everything is heavenly. There is no sorrow. There is no need to wipe away a tear from my eye in heaven. But it's in 21 where we read uh, that he's going to wipe away the tear. There's still an ongoing battle uh, here on earth for those that have been left behind. And there's still some things taking place. And the interesting thing and the point that I want to make, drawing our understanding closer to Scripture in what is heaven and leaving behind the silly thoughts of carnality as to what is heaven going to look like and, and encouraging you that it's all of that. How could we go to heaven and be encouraged knowing a loved one has been left behind? Something really big is going to have to happen to make that okay. Something beyond our understanding. But it's going to happen. And God's going to do it. At this point in, in our scriptures, we read some very interesting things. In Revelation chapter 21 and 10 and 11, reading on from the same passage. It says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, uh, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. This new heaven, this new Jerusalem that is descending, that it is not yet. It's not up there. It's yet to be. Uh, and, and it's not yet established. But interestingly, in, in verse 16, they give the dimensions of this new uh, Jerusalem coming down uh, out from uh, up above. The dimensions of the new Jerusalem, that holy city of God, uh, they measure it in ancient terms, but it boils down to 15,000 miles uh, deep, 15,000 miles across, and 15,000 miles high. I wonder if we'll be able to ascend as Jesus Christ did, but it's cubed. Do, can you think of another cube, the only other cube mentioned in the Bible? That holy of holies. And so now, as I think of heaven, I'm not thinking of a playground where I'll be able to dunk. I'm not thinking of these carnal things uh, that are just uh, fleeting and vain. I'm thinking of the presence of God 
And as he describes to us here, this holy city coming down in the size of the most holy of holies, it makes me understand. Yes, heaven is the dwelling place of God, but there's a union that takes place, that can wipe away every tear, that can take away every sadness, uh, and can transform uh, our understanding in its beauty. The temple that was pointed to in Eden, that was pointed to in the tabernacle, in Jerusalem, in Jesus Christ, in the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, is finally established uh, in, its, in its perfection there in heaven. And heaven is God and man dwelling together as one. Not in status, uh, but in oneness of, of uh, existence. So that when we read in John chapter 17, we see and understand more of what Jesus was trying to say right before he went to the cross. His, almost his last words to his Father were praying for us to understand heaven. And he says there in John 17, verses 20 to 24, he's, uh, 20, 23, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe in me through their word, through the word of the disciples, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world would believe that Thou hast sent me. And the glory which Thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and Thou in me, that they, may be, that they might be perfect in one, and that the world may know that Thou hast sent me and hast loved me as Thou hast loved me. This is heaven. This is God's promise to us. And this, uh, even though it's beyond our comprehension, and honestly, as a young man, if you'd say uh, you can worship God uh, in the beauty of His holiness or go hunting, uh, you know, don't look for me in the temple. I would be hunting because it just seemed more fun. But that's carnal. And that's that chord where God is drawing us to a higher understanding uh, and our carnality is drawing us back to silly thinking. God wants to be one uh, with you and I and has promised and has made it so and has made it possible. In Revelation, that same passage, although I missed a hugely important part. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22 to 24. This is amazing. We've seen the temple uh, again and again, beginning in Genesis, in Revelation, starting in chapter 3, uh, again and again, the temple in heaven, right? Listen to what John sees uh, the Lord shows him in verses 22 to 24. 22 says, And I saw no temple therein, speaking of the holy city. For the Lord God Almighty, the Lamb, are the temple of it. And the city had no need of sun, neither the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Did you see that? No temple in heaven. How is it that there's a temple, that there's a temple, that there's a temple, and now as all of our tears and all of the sorrow, everything has been made new, there is no temple. It's because that God has brought us into that oneness that I had mentioned. Wow. Praise God. I never really thought that the, that the book of God concludes with the elimination of a temple. Oh, I believe we'll be able to go to a place and see, and maybe with Moses, uh, see the broken tablets of the Ten Commandments. I don't think he set aside the Ark of the Covenant. I would like to talk with Moses as we're looking at the broken stones and say, what were you thinking? Uh, I got really, really mad. <laughs> you know, we don't know. 
but that, that God has eliminated the need for an intermediate and has brought us into a oneness with Him. Praise God for this thought. The passage concludes uh, again with God's desire that you might be there. He says in Revelation chapter 21, 27, it says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, and neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. There is one thing that is most important in this life, and it's to make sure your name is written in that book. I don't care if you don't understand about Ezekiel. Uh, I don't care if you think whatever. It is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. There was a professional singer. Her name was Ruth Ann Metzger. Very, very gifted at professional level. So much so that it would be odd for her to sing at a wedding. Uh, you know, we, we don't sing... I don't, know, I don't know why Michael Jackson came to my mind, but it'd be odd to have Michael Jackson sing at your wedding for several reasons. Uh, <laughs> but she was a professional singer, and when she received this invitation, she said uh, she would sing. She received the invitation. Uh, there's the RSVP on the refrigerator, uh, and she's singing at this one. Multi, multi-millionaire. They had rented out the, the top two floors of the highest skyscraper in the Northwest. And as she sang uh, wonderfully, the, the wedding ceremony progressed and to the time of the celebration of the wedding feast, uh, the bride and the groom go up these glass stairs uh, with brass rails and uh, elegant to everything. Couldn't, couldn't, you imagine it, the ice carvings, the, the, the tuxedos on all of the servers, uh, and up they go, and, and a line forms uh, at the glass stairs uh, to go into the wedding feast. And she gets there, and there's a very uh, formal uh, man dressed there, and he's got an elegant book, and he says, uh, name please, and she says, Ruth Ann Metzger, this is my husband Roy, uh, and he says, oh, I can't find it in the M's. And would you spell it? And so she carefully spells it. He says, I'm sorry, it's not here. And she, a terror comes over her. And she looks across the way and she sees the groom. Uh, but he's across this big room and he's with the guests. And uh, she looks at the place settings and there's names uh, carefully placed and, and designed you don't want to put Aunt Susie with Uncle Michael. It would be a problem. Uh, everything's been arranged just so. And she stands there in silence. And the man at the top of the stairs says to, to the usher, would you usher these folks to the server's elevator? He ushers them over and actually reaches in and hits G for ground uh, and they go and they leave that beautiful place and they find their car and they're driving home and the, wi the husband wisely hasn't said anything uh, and uh, at some point he puts his hand on her arm and he said what happened uh, she said you know I received the RSVP she said but I was busy she said I was singing anyway she told the man at the top of the stairs, I'm the singer I sang at this wedding. He said, it didn't matter. What you did is your name in the book. She cried. And her husband said, it's okay. She said, no, I'm not crying about that. She said, it's just struck me for the first time that Jesus Christ has sent out an invitation. But there's an RSVP. Did you know that when the temple here on earth, when Jesus Christ died, that the temple, uh, the veil was ripped open as if to say, all are welcome. But Jesus at the cross, no one was magically placed into the Holy of Holies. There's something required. Jesus paid it all. 
But there's something required of each of us. It says in Revelation 3, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. In 1 John, it tells us what is that overcoming. He says, he that, he, Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Is your name written down uh, in that book? Or will you be sent uh, outside of the presence of God? And are you living life thinking of heaven? Thinking of that day when your knees won't ache, when you won't hear news that troubles you? Uh, and better than that, seeing and being in the presence of God. I know it's beyond our comprehension uh, and, and maybe even isn't that attractive to you. But you would have to trust that the God that did all this, the God that loves you and is all-powerful, has done something beyond your comprehension. And it's going to be a good day. Would you live your life uh, thinking of that? And if you have not RSVP'd uh, today, um, would you come and see me? I'd gladly pray and... Uh, We'll fill out the form together. I'll, I'll show you where to sign your name and you can pray the prayer and confess to God. I believe you did that. I believe you love me. and I believe you want me to spend eternity in your presence. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Lord, thank you for heaven, that holy of holy places that you provided for us. Lord, I pray that each one here would be present, Lord, that we would have sent our RSVP as we've understood Jesus, the cross and the gospel, Lord, that you loved us and died for us. Lord, I pray that we would respond and say, God, thank you. God, forgive me and someday take me to your holy place that I might dwell with you. I pray, God, that you'd help us to see clearly the things you have in store for us and to be careful as we live. In Jesus' name, amen.